All right. <clears throat> In theory, I am live. Hey, everybody. Welcome, to, finally, for an episode of Open Space. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, we, a um, um, sort of friend of the, uh, of the show and one of our mods, um, passed away and so we weren't able to do the show then and then last week I completely forgot that it was Canadian Thanksgiving and uh, and then I rescheduled so it's actually been two weeks th since three weeks since we've done this so um, <clears throat> uh, so apologies to everybody who <laughs> had to reschedule we've also been ha having a really hard time with the um, with scheduling the virtual star parties I promise you we have been trying to make these star parties happen and we're just getting either continuing smoke and bad conditions, uh, technical malfunctions with telescopes. This is why we stopped doing the star parties last time, was it just got too difficult to try. You just felt terrible. It's just each week you're like, nope, we can't do this. I'm sorry, everybody. So I think, um, but, but Nancy's on the case. Nancy Graziano, we're going to push through. We will make the star parties happen, even if we need to get every single telescope, operational telescope on planet Earth available to our disposal. We will bring back the star parties. So uh, we had one just sneak preview where we actually even saw like Neptune. It was amazing. Um, so now we're, uh, so we just need to get back operational. The, uh, the, the California telescope is is non-functional right now there's there's been the smoke you know the the telescope bays so anyway we'll get there we'll get there um again i also apologize for the for the terrible sound quality on last week's interview it was an amazing interview but the but his internet was so bad i i can't even really i don't think i can even release it on my podcast feed because it's just like I don't I would just want to scrape my ears out to listen to it which is just heartbreaking I don't know whether I clean up the audio whether I just like cut out edit nicely pieces so we don't have to hear the frustrating uh loss of signal anyway it's uh frustrating anyway um got a couple of upcoming episodes uh upcoming interviews um later on this week uh, we're going to be interviewing uh, the CEO of Hero X, which is uh, an offshoot of the X Prize. And uh, those some of you who may know, his name's Christian Cotacini, and he, uh, he I used to work with him uh, on many companies and projects, so we know each other very well. Um, but he's working with NASA on a whole bunch of really interesting prizes. So we'll be talking to him about just sort of what role prizes play in in NASA's idea and just in just in general as a way to accomplish problems. Um, and then we've got a couple of other really interesting interviews with some writers coming up uh, in the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned for all of that. Um, yeah, Chris is saying too bad you couldn't record it at each end and then edit it together. Yeah, there's a level of tech technical acumen that that guests just, you know, we can't expect them all to be to run their own recording studio. And so they're just not as uh, just not able to provide the level of, of, you know, the high end fidelity that would be great. So, uh, but anyway, that is uh, that's the plan. So, what do we got? Uh, Fred Watson next week, right on. Okay, great. <laughs> it's gonna be fun. Uh, okay, great. So, uh, as always, if anybody has any questions for me about space and or astronomy. This is your show, not mine. I'm just here to just to just answer whatever questions you might have about the universe, about various projects that are happening in space. Uh, why hasn't James Webb launched? Um, all of those kinds of questions. Go ahead and, and hit me with your questions. Um, otherwise, I'll just keep blathering updated current events. We just go the whole show for an hour. Um, Let's see if anyone has any questions or not. Uh, I can just talk about what I'm working on. What am I working on? Uh, I guess, sure, hit me with a question. Otherwise, um, uh, yeah, we've, I've been t putting a ton of work into universe today. We brought on a bunch of new writers. Like I know it seems like you haven't seen much of me here on YouTube, 
but I've been doing a mountain of work with Universe Today. We, our coverage is is uh, doubled. It feels like we've got pretty much twice as many articles, and and I'm really happy with the quality and the number of of articles that we're putting out in Universe Today. The newsletter just keeps getting bigger. It takes me longer to write every week. I think the last edition, this edition wasn't too bad. It was only like 27 stories that I put into it, but there was like one that was like crossing 30. So um, there was a lot of, uh, so there's just a ton of coverage on, on university, a lot of new writers. So it's been, it's been great. All right, uh, now we got a couple of questions here. Um, John Holleran, have we learned anything more about the Venus search for life? Uh, at this point, no. Um, there was this week, there was a flyby of the European Space Agency's Bepi Colombo spacecraft going past Venus on its way to Mercury. And it's doing these flybys of Venus to do gravity assists. And it did a flyby of, of Venus and some amazing pictures that we've seen that were shared out onto the, uh, out onto the internet. But we're still waiting for the data. It's very fortunate Bepi Colombo is equipped with some instruments to try to assist in the search for phosphine on Venus. But it's not the right machine to really provide any kind of conclusive evidence. To really know if there is phosphine and what the source of the phosphine is on Venus, we're going to have to send some kind of spacecraft that's going to be able to go through the cloud tops and actually you know, be a balloon that floats around inside the clouds of Venus and is constantly looking for some sort of particulate, some kind of, of biological material that you can then tie to life. And there are, I mean, there's a bunch of ideas. We, we did a video a couple of, I guess, like, like a year ago, maybe, of all the different um, missions that have been proposed for flying in the cloud tops of Venus, as well as down on the surface of Venus. And I'll link to those in the like, if you're watching this after the fact, there'll be like a card here, that'll say it. Um, but if you search my channel for Venus, you'll see them. And and so the ideas are roughly the same. It's just now that some of them are getting a little more fast tracked. And then one of the additional ideas is uh, breakthrough, the Breakthrough Foundation is considering a um, they're considering their own mission to try to do this as well. So I think that we're going to get to a point where um, we'll see a mission flying to Venus very soon within the next couple of years because Venus is really quick and easy to get to. Like it's, I, I've mentioned this, I know sort of each time I've done these shows that they were so fortunate that Venus is so close that we can just double check any idea, discover a new particle in the atmosphere of Venus, create a brand new spacecraft and send it and it'll be there in nine, you know, just a couple of months. So it's a it's very, uh, very fortunate. So no, this, this discovery is unfolding. Um, and, and don't be surprised, don't be shocked, shocked, if it turns out to be an abiotic method that it's not life that's producing it. Because so far, every time anyone's ever thought they saw life on a planet out there, it turned out to be not life. So it's going to be that too. Probably until it isn't. All right, let's move on. Um, uh, okay, all right, Neil Yu. Fraser, did you see the Mars Society videos? Thoughts Musk interview? Yeah, so if you don't know, um, Elon Musk spoke at the Mars Society's annual convention this year, which of course, like all conventions, was a virtual convention. And I watched the whole interview with Elon Musk, and it was, it was okay. Um, I found there was like too much kind of behind the scenes stuff that we already knew about how rockets work and what some of the big challenges work. And we kind of wanted to know what the, what are the cutting edge technical issues that he's facing right now. Um, Rob, Robert Zubrin asked him a bunch of questions just about the overall timeline. And he thinks at this point that Starship is going to fly to orbit. It's going to do its hop within the next month or so, the, the 20K hop. It's going to fly to orbit sometime next year ideally return from orbit sometime next year. That's going to be the tricky part, he, he said in advance. He figures it should be possible to send a spacecraft to Mars by 2024, which is a slipping, I guess, one Mars window from his original timeline when he presented the idea of the interplanetary transport system. Um, 
But, you know, we'll give him some slack. I'll give it, so what if it even happens in 2026? That'll still be fine. You know, not 2028, though, Musk. You're on a timeline. Um, because, you know, that's too long. We've waited 50 years for human beings to go back into space. You know, we can't wait two more. Um, but he also just talked about the fact that if they can get orbital refueling figured out, then being able to go to the moon is relatively straightforward. So, so really, everything rests on this spaceship's ability, the Starship's ability to come back through the atmosphere. Like if they can figure that out, then we will see a very bold and interesting future. And if they just can't figure that out, then it could be that the whole platform isn't going to work in the way that, that it's in, it's envisioned. Because again, I've, you know, we've done videos about even just like coming into the Martian atmosphere. Mars is the worst place to try to land a spacecraft. Nobody has figured out a way to put more than about a ton down onto the surface of Mars. And Musk says they can come in with a hundred tons. Sounds tough. Um, but I can't wait to be proven wrong. Uh, Jack D, how big would the Earth be if it was turned into a black hole? I forget the exact number. I feel like I just did this in a video, but it would be tiny, like like microscopic. Um, there's there's some great black hole calculators, and you can just put in the mass, and then it'll tell you what the size of the event horizon is. But it would be very very small. Like you could absolutely hold it in your hand, be smaller than your hand. Like so, yeah. Um, but it's not possible, so don't worry about it. Um, Peter de Jong, can space be infinite when it started small at the moment of the Big Bang? So there's this idea that the when you envision in your mind the Big Bang, you're imagining this this singularity, this tiny little ball that's just hovering in nothingness, and then suddenly. The thing expanded out, exploded out, and you've got all this debris and material, and you've got stars and stuff exploding out, and you get the universe as it as we know it today. And that is not accurate. That is not that is not the way modern cosmology considers the Big Bang. That it's really just a change in density. That at the beginning of the universe as we understand it the universe was more dense and now the universe is less dense. It could have been infinite at the beginning of the universe and it would still be infinite now. It could have been finite at the beginning of the universe and still be finite now. And if it was finite, then it wraps. So you go all the way to the right hand side and you come out on the left hand side. You go all the way to the top, you come out on the bottom. It's like a three dimensional game of asteroids. And so you just have this situation where you've got the universe is more dense and then it becomes less dense. And that's what the Big Bang really is. And so that matches our observation that we're standing in one galaxy and we look in all directions and we see all the other galaxies moving away from us. And yet if you move to any one of those other galaxies, you would see all the other galaxies moving away from you. That's not what you would see if you were part of an explosion. Some, you know, only if you were at the very center of the explosion would you see everything moving away from you. But if you were near one side of the explosion, you would see parts would be closer to you, other parts would be moving way faster away from you. But what we see is that the entire universe is just expanding evenly. And so it's just a decrease in density over time. And so you could just run back the clock. But it could have just still been infinite right at the very beginning. Um... Ted Krauss, do you think that we will mine the moon for helium-3? Maybe someday we will mine the moon for helium-3. But like when you think about the list of challenges that we have to go through, which is first, we have to be able to make fusion reactors work. And right now, the our best shot at making a fusion reactor work, you know, the mainstream best version is like the ITER, facility in in Europe, which is this gigantic power plant that's going to attempt to make fusion be energy uh, neutral for the first time in the history of humanity for long periods of time. Um, if they can get that to work, then you can imagine them trying to make it smaller and then make it smaller. And then eventually you could get something that could maybe fly in space. Um, to bring helium back from the moon back to Earth, it will never make sense. It'll never make sense financially to bring helium back 
from, from the moon. The only reason you want to do it is you want to use the helium on the moon to power your fusion reactors. So people always talk about these ideas like, will we ever mine asteroids and we bring all this gold back to the earth? There's really no financial value to bring any kind of asteroid, anything from space back down to earth. It will always be cheaper to build that stuff here on earth, whether you're doing, doing power through solar panels, whether you're doing, um, whether you're mining precious metals, like it'll be cheaper to just, just boil the oceans, well, filter the oceans to, to extract gold and other precious metals. than it will be to go to space, to bring gold back to earth. Even if you could find an asteroid made entirely made of gold, it would still be too expensive to do that. It's that using materials out in space, harvesting them from space. That's what makes a ton of sense. And so we will be harvesting the moon for all its various resources, including maybe helium three, who knows, um, for facilities on the moon. And then we'll be harvesting stuff from the asteroid belts for the use in the asteroid belts that, that we will always be attempting to gain or gather our resources from the closest possible place. So that is the, that's the value. Uh, Larry is talking about helium. Yeah. H2 versus H3 hydrogen two versus, um, uh, deuterium versus tritium, I think. So we're just so far down the road of being able to use fusion. There's some, there's some total benefits from running fusion. You get a lot less radioactivity. You can, you can, have a less dangerous reactor if you run helium three in your reactor. And that'll be great for spaceship drives. But like, again, we're just like, we're so far into the future. Why? It's been 50 years since human beings have gone to the moon. Let's, let's do that again. And then maybe the 400th time people will, will be able to mine helium three. All right. Um, Stuart McKenna. Do you think about the inflation? What do you think about the inflation theory of the Big Bang? Do you think that it correctly explains why space is flat and clean? So the Big Bang theory, and it's been a while since I've done a video on this, so I apologize. I'm going to be a little hazy on this, but the Big Bang theory beautifully explains the expansion or the decreased density of the universe, the decreasing density of the universe as we see it today. The fact that the galaxies are moving away from us in all directions. And so when you see galaxies moving away from you in all directions, it makes sense to run the clock backwards and say, okay, fine. If the galaxies are, are farther apart today than they were yesterday, what if you turned thing time around, then they would be closer and closer and closer. And eventually you would get to a point where, you know, every part of the universe that we see today was gathered together in a very small area. Now it still could have been infinite. So, you know, every part of the universe was, had its own part that was beside it in the beginning, but is now really far apart. Um, but, but the big bang theory breaks down right at the very beginning that there are a bunch of problems that you would expect to see that we don't see when, when astronomers make these observations. And so the one that you're mentioning, what did you say? You described it as, um, uh, space is flat and clean. So the gist is, is that in order to get the, essentially the, the temperature smoothness that astronomers see in the universe today. When you look at the cosmic microwave background radiation, the temperature variations in the, in the background are very similar, so similar that it doesn't make sense that, that these parts were sort of connected to each other, that the energy didn't have time to be able to communicate all of these different spots unless they were exactly together but then you wouldn't get the expansion at the same rate that we see today. And so this is why astronomers propose this idea of inflation, that, that the universe went from the entire, all of the parts of the visible universe that we can see today were touching in a way that they could communicate and they could essentially move, make their temperatures very similar. And then suddenly it went through this rapid, rapid expansion rate and this sort of freezed out those temperature changes and then the, the universe continued to expand. And so this is like a theoretical framework to explain some of the, 
the nuanced problems that cosmologists have with the Big Bang. And it is consistent and explains it. There is some evidence that this period of inflation actually happened, but it is by no means a slam dunk. And if somebody else can come along and come up with a, with a different way to explain um, how you can get the, you know, to fix the issues with the Big Bang, then that that could completely replace this idea of inflation. And so there's tons of room for that. And when you think about sort of how theories have to be able to compete, if you've got, uh, say you've got some theory, and we'll give an example, like say Newtonian physics, right? Newton looked at the moon, looked at the way objects drop, did the math, invented calculus, had to figure out how the moon is going around the earth, that it's, that it's falling the entire way. And Einstein came along and, and looked at some of the problems with Newtonian physics, the fact that mercury isn't exactly where it's supposed to be. What happens in intense gravity wells? What happens at high levels of, of acceleration you know, as you approach the speed of light? And so he came up with a new theory that fully explains, that, that matches the predictions made by Newton. So that's like, that's your first job is you've got to match the predictions that the you know made by anyone else then he was able to also explain the 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 places where the current theory fell down and that's of course like i said the positions of mercury mercury because in fact mercury is is experiencing this frame dragging from the sun it's being slightly shifted from where it should be and so you so einstein job one match all the predictions made by newton job two fix the mistakes made by Newton. Job three, make predictions that are fully testable. And so then that's what astronomers are still doing. You know, we often, we joke about writing these articles on Universe Today. Oh, Einstein, write again, because some measurement that's been made out in the universe perfectly matches the predictions made by Einstein almost a hundred years ago. And so you've got to do those three things. You've got to, you've got to match the current theories, You've got to fix the mistakes of the new theory, of the of the other theory, and you've got to make some novel predictions that are then proven out by experiments. Do that, and you get to have a Nobel Prize. And so when we go back to this idea of inflation, inflation matches the predictions um, made by the Big Bang. It fixes these problems the Big Bang has and how you get this sort of evenness of temperature across the entire universe. And it makes new predictions that should be testable. There should be primordial gravitational waves that are that are seen back in the early universe that are that were generated by the inflation. There's other temperature variations, other things that should be possible to detect. And that's what astronomers are aiming at to try and prove. And if they can find some of these things, then inflation moves to join the Big Bang, join evolution in that level, that sort of you know, theory in the scientific term. Um, Abhinjan Saraswat Gogoi, that's a great name. Um, why didn't the universe collapse just after the Big Bang? So a lot of people, so again, this is back to this idea that if the universe was an explosion, then the mutual gravity of all of the galaxies in the universe would sort of pull it back down together and it would you know, come back together. And the point is, is that what we see as the universe, as the observable universe around us, this, this expanding observable universe is not an accurate picture of what's actually going on. That, that in fact, right, we are looking back in time as we look outward in space. And so it, um, so it's sort of like both we're seeing distance, but we're also seeing time. And so it's really hard to be able to kind of wrap your head around that. And so in order for the universe to get, and I'll give you a sort of example, like imagine you had two magnets and you put the two magnets side by side and you let go and they'll just click together. And so you pull them apart and they'll click back together. And so like, imagine that's the whole universe. It's just those two magnets, you pull them apart, click, the universe collapses in on itself. But if you have three magnets, right, then two of them are going to click together and one is left on its own. Have 20 magnets, right? They're going to start clumping into larger pieces. And so in order, if, if the entire 
universe was just what we can observe, then it does make sense. The universe would somehow attract. But of course, there could just be more outward momentum that was causing everything to, to fly apart. But the thing is, is that what we see of the universe is actually just a fragment of what was actually there. And so there would be, you know, there was no, there wasn't enough of an over density in any one spot to be able to pull the whole universe back together. And back in the 1990s, I mean, astronomers have been trying to figure this out for the long time, which is even in the our observable universe, was the universe going to just continue expanding, expanding, just coast to a halt, all the galaxies would coast to a halt, and then their mutual gravity would start pulling them together. And then these clumps would come together, and you would get essentially the the Big Bang in reverse, although not exactly. And so astronomers went out to try and measure this expansion rate of all of the, the galaxies. And what they found was not only are the galaxies not coasting to a stop, they're actually accelerating. And this is, of course, the discovery of, of dark energy. And now astronomers are trying to just figure out what is the um, exactly how does the dark energy work? How, when did it take over? How long has it been accelerating the expansion of the universe? Is it changing? Is it itself changing over time, leading to potentially a big rip down the, you know, down the road? So these are all still unanswered questions. But, but, you know, it's, it goes back to that question of like, why didn't the universe just turn into a black hole? And the reason is because that you need to have, if all you had was just a bunch of stuff, and then it would just sort of fall together. And then, yeah, you might get a black hole. But, but you need to have that over density in one area instead of a universe in it that was almost exactly the same density everywhere, maybe an infinite in all directions. And so there wasn't any one amount that could collapse down and form a gigantic black hole. But we talked about these, this idea of primordial black holes in a fairly recent episode. So there could have been over densities in small areas, and those could have turned into primordial black holes. But the fact is that we have a universe, so we know that there wasn't an over density to the point that the whole thing turned into a black hole. Um, all right. Dwayne Duvall is asking, did they get a piece of that asteroid yet? Ben, was it, wasn't it supposed to be today? So if you're watching this right now, live, um, Osiris Rex is getting ready to gather a sample from asteroid Bennu. It's going to happen tomorrow afternoon. So it's going to happen on Tuesday afternoon. I'm sure somebody can put the exact time, but, um, but I don't know the, the precise time. It was like when I started doing my story research this morning at nine o'clock, it was like 28 hours. So it's gonna be like four hours. It's like, like 1 PM Pacific ish. So, uh, am I going to be live for it? I'll watch it. I'm not going to do a broadcast to override NASA while they, while they do it, but I'm definitely going to watch it and I'm sure I'll be tweeting about it and, and things like that. Uh, AB Scott and flower can condensed light be turned into matter E equals MC squared. So in theory, sure. And I mean, you know, the name, right? A Google blitz. So, uh, you can make a black hole out of anything. You can make a black hole out of matter. You can make a black hole out of energy. You can make a black hole out of antimatter, uh, dark matter, whatever you want, assuming dark matter is a thing. Um, and any mixture of all of those that as long as you compress enough into a small area, you'll get a black hole. And so you're asking, well, like, how could you compress light into a small enough area to get a black hole? And so E equals MC squared tells you how much light has to be compressed. It's the equivalent. So you could either compress a star's worth of matter into a small size to make a black hole. I forget what the size is, like uh, the size of like a couple of kilometers across. Um, or you have to compress light, a sun's mass equivalent of light into the same area, and you would get a black hole as well. And so um, could you turn light into matter? I guess in theory, if you were able to compress light into the same. So Eve's gotten flowers saying, but light has no mass. Yeah, but it does have a mass equivalent. It like light has gravity. You if you compress a whole bunch of light into an area, you could make things orbit around it like a planet because E equals MC squared tells you what the equivalent mass of light is. 
And that was what Einstein, that was sort of one of his greatest gifts. That's why we use E equals MC squared. That's what it means, is it means that light and energy, oh, sorry, energy and matter are, you know, are equivalent. Okay. Uh, Ted Krauss, uh, the magnetic poles are moving and could be devastating. What's your take on the pole swapping anytime soon? Well, the fact that we're here on Earth, the fact that there have not been mass extinction events that match up with the times when the, the Earth's north and south magnetic poles flip around, like they've happened during humanity's life on Earth. I think the last one was like 700,000 years ago. So they happen fairly regularly. And there's no evidence that they are devastating to the planet. It could be that they are very jumbled up, that you'll have auroras on all kinds of latitudes, that, that, that compasses don't work. Um, but there's no reason to believe that it's going to be devastating because we've gone through hundreds of them and life has been fine. And it no, there's no match, no correlation between mass extinction events and and magnetic field redistributions. Redistribu it seems to be a thing that happens. We're not exactly sure how quickly it happens, but it seems to happen very quickly. And it's not like there's no, there's no magnetic field at all. It's just that it's a mess. When you look at the sun, right? The sun has this 11 year cycle where it's north magnetic pole and it's south magnetic pole flip around. And you get, um, the, it gets more and more turbulent in the various regions. The, the, you know, at the very at the beginning of it, it's like a very clear, crisp north south, and then it just sort of moves down and gets more wobbly, wibbly wobbly, and then it just flips around and then comes back up again, and everything is smooth again. And so it could be that we're going to get something like that. If we saw um, mass extinction events perfectly lined up with magnetic field flips, then we would be worried, but we are not. <laughs> well, can Zappen, Zappen says, will Canada miss having the magnetic North Pole? Yeah. Yeah. Just like, wouldn't it be super weird? Like if compasses just didn't work? That auroras happened anywhere? Yeah, it would be a very, very weird thing. All right. I'm going to go farther back. Missed a bunch of questions here. Um, how? Okay. Blue Pill asks, how is air pressure possible without a physical container? Gravity is your physical container. Um, why is the Earth a sphere? The Earth is a sphere because of the mutual gravity of all of the parts of the planet pulling inward, pulling on each other, and it forms of a, a shape that is the smallest possible volume with the largest possible surface area. Is that right? Um, and that's a sphere. Um, and so you get the atmosphere is surrounding is being pulled down by the gravity of the earth and the air pressure that you experience is just how strong the gravity can pull down. If earth's gravity was stronger, but it was the same amount of atmosphere, then you would have a higher atmospheric pressure. If the earth had more atmosphere, uh, like Venus, then you would have a thicker atmospheric pressure. So it's just, it's the gravity is the container. And as you get higher and higher up away from the earth, then you get lower and lower air pressure. Um, Arjun asks, when Starship starts to have test landings, will it land on a barge or will it need an island? Yeah, this is still a bit of an unknown question, which is what is going to happen with Starship. This spaceship is very big and uh, it's hard to describe. It's hard to wrap your head around how much energy is going to be released, how much energy is contained within the, within the rocket if it explodes, how loud they're going to be as they take off and land. And if they're happening multiple times per uh, day, it's just going to be nonstop constant noise. So it's going to make sense to have it, have the facility, both the launch and landing facility to be offshore. And so I'm sure that we'll see some future where you've got some bridge that takes you out to the Starship facility and it's maybe a couple of kilometers offshore and that's where they take off and land. Um, 
still a big question. Uh, peaks and pokes. Would it really cost more than a ton of gold to bring a ton of gold back to Earth? Yeah, absolutely. Um, right now, it costs, say, $3,000 per kilogram to launch just something from the surface of the Earth. But it's more like $500,000 per kilogram to get it to the moon. So I don't know what a kilogram of gold costs. But then you've also got to bring it back from the moon, which is even more expensive. Um, the, during the Apollo mission, they spent $300 billion in inflation-adjusted dollars to do all of the missions, to do the, you know, all of the ones that landed humans. So 12 human beings landed on the surface of the moon. It cost $300 billion to bring them and some lunar rocks back from the surface of the moon. So uh, a few billion dollars per person. I'm, you know, I'm sure someone can do the math, but it's very expensive. Very, very, very expensive. Um, let's see. Apologies. There was a question that came up earlier that I thought was really good. I think I lost it. Simon Farmer, which biologist do you draw your belief about the rarity of abiogenesis or other claims such as rare intelligence? Um, so I'm not sure if I, if I draw my claims about, about rare life from biologists, but I read the book Rare Earth, which explained by oh, Brownlee and I forget the other writer, but blew my mind, a really powerful book. And the idea being that, that there's a lot of really important factors that went into habitability here on Earth. It's not just that we have a, a nice star, that we're at the right distance from the star, you know, it's also that we have a moon, that the moon was at the right distance, that the moon created tidal flats that would allow, give life, encourage life to be able to, to live in the water, but also be able to live on land. And, and that we have a giant, uh, we have a dynamo inside the earth that provides a magnetosphere that protects us, that, you know, there's a ton of factors. Like if you did a proper, like a real Drake equation, you went through every single factor that led to life on earth, then you would end up with a large number of, of factors, um, maybe hundreds. I keep meaning that it would be cool for us to do an, uh, like a series on, on a revised Drake equation. And so that's a very powerful argument. And it, it explains nicely the fact that we don't see aliens, that if, that if life was really simple to form and thrive, then we should see life. Like right now, we definitely don't see dinosaurs and trees and rabbits and um, manta rays and all kinds of stuff across the solar system. Like we're at the point now where we're, we're, we're just arguing about whether or not there's cyanobacteria. That if we find cyanobacteria on Mars, then it will be an incredible discovery. And so if you take that same idea and you play it out across the Milky Way, it just seems like you have to have really special conditions for life. And that matches this idea of the Fermi paradox that, that, that life, that the universe is old and, and that the moment life could have formed on earth, it did. And we see this incredible diversity of life going into every niche of the entire planet that the, that the Milky way is big, but it's not that big. And a civilization would only need a few million years to be able to, to replicate across the entire Milky Way. And so it's back to where is everybody? So when I sort of, the rareness of life is a reasonable explanation for why we feel like we're alone. That's my, that's sort of the way I look at it. The, the fact that we don't see any aliens out there, uh, to me seems like, like we are first, like in terms of intelligent civilizations or we're one of the only uh, life forms that ever, you know, we're the, maybe one of the only places that multicellular life ever happened. I can't wait to be proven wrong. Like I cannot wait. I, I feel this existential, um, it's hard to describe, but like I'm worried that we will mess this up 
that we will that we will use up the resources on planet Earth, that we will pollute ourselves out of existence or nuclear war ourselves out of existence. And then it'll be the octopus's job to try to take over um, or the or the chimpanzees or the dolphins or whatever. And we won't have left them with enough useful materials. We burned up all the trees that were laid down over hundreds of millions of years and they just don't have any resources to be able to 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 become a spacefaring civilization. And then the sun will expand and and it will wipe out all life on Earth and then life will have been in the universe and then life will be gone. And I think the universe is improved by life. It's made better by, by not necessarily humanity's existence, but by life's existence. Life makes, life, the universe is improved by life. And it would be sad to not have life in the universe. And until we find any kind of evidence whatsoever, um, it's our responsibility to keep trying to push uh, out into space to try to preserve life and to try to protect the planet and to try to spread out into the, into the universe and to stop uh, life from going extinct entirely. And again, like literally the moment um, the aliens send us a message or Neil, you, as soon as, as soon as someone can prove Neil that the UFOs are visiting us, then, then I'm perfectly happy to just kick back and just let someone else beat someone else's problem. Um, I, I, I actually posted Neil. Uh, I actually had a brief conversation with Elon Musk on this on Twitter a couple of days ago, and I sort of posted this, and he liked my tweet. So uh, I think you know, I think he he and I are of one mind on this. All right, let's go back. Um, Zach, do you think it would be cooler if Space Force was called Starfleet? He said, "Yeah, I feel like I've been on the record that that Starfleet is a much better name. Like if you go with Starfleet." then that just puts in your mind what kind of an organization you're trying to build. Space Force, it's fine. It's cool. I like it. I like, I, like I do like the name Space Force. I'm not going to lie. It sounds pretty awesome. It sounds pretty rad. But Starfleet, that makes me think about the Prime Directive, and it makes me think about boldly going where no one's gone before and exploration and and science. So, so I would prefer Starfleet. So you just like you just – you prime everybody's mind to to live up to the expectations of Starfleet in advance. Um, Dr. Ed Elcott, cryptozoologist. Would there be a universe if life wasn't there to observe it? Good question. Uh, I mean, there's kind of two theories, right? One theory is that the universe would not exist if there weren't life to see it. Um, and then there's this idea, it's called the Copernican principle. And the gist is the universe doesn't need us. <laughs> the universe would exist without us. And one of the, uh, the sort of thought experiments that you have to sort of figure out whether or not the universe would exist without us, like if the universe requires an observer, could the universe generate its own observer? And this is this idea of a Boltzmann brain. So we know that there, there are uh, random fluctuations in, in the universe, quantum fluctuations. If you wait long enough, particles will appear. If you wait even longer, larger structures will appear. And if you wait long enough, entire planets will appear just randomly through quantum fluctuations. And so could you wait long enough so that some conscious entity suddenly arises and observes the universe, observes themselves and observes the universe. Seems like a paradox. And yet, so we don't need an observer to observe the universe for the universe to exist. But, you know, more experiments are required. Um, let's see. Uh, T260, Fraser, what is a launch that you're wanting to see in person? I want to see Starship. I, I absolutely want to see a Starship launch. Uh, I've only seen one rocket launch, and that was OSIRIS-REx, which is going to be landing on, a, on, a, on an asteroid tomorrow. Um, but 
it was fine. It was great. You know, it was a rocket <laughs> took off and you could feel the rumble of the rockets and you could see it uh, passing up and so bright. It was really cool. But I mean, I, I almost got a chance to see a space shuttle and and it's apparently like next level and Starship is next level from the space shuttle. I can't even imagine how dramatic it would be to watch one of those things take off. So hopefully, I don't think I'll go for like one of the first ones, but if they are regularly launching, I will definitely go and try to watch a Starship take off. It'll be amazing. And fortunately, it'll happen all the time. Um, Delicious Plum, the new astronaut suits appear to have less mass. Does anyone in the chat room know if the new SpaceX suits are lighter? So the... um, when you look at sort of the traditional space shuttle suits, those orange suits that they wore, the ACES suit, the advanced crew escape suit, the, the, the orange suits that the, that the astronauts wore, those were designed to allow them to escape from the space shuttle in case of some kind of disaster. And they were, they were a design that was put in after the, the space shuttle uh, Challenger disaster when if the astronauts had a little more time, maybe they could have gotten out of the space shuttle. And so they needed to have a spacesuit that would help provide pressure, would help protect them more from the rigors of, of space flight, uh, would be able to help keep them protected when they, if they jumped out and used a parachute and landed in the ocean. Um, but the new, um, the SpaceX ones that the astronauts are wearing, because the the actual capsule is a lot safer. They don't actually need to be as protective as spacesuits. And so they're able to be able to, uh, you know, provide some of pressure duties. They've got a helmet, but they're not looking to create something that is as robust as what the space shuttle, space shuttle astronauts wore. Uh, the Russians wear a thing called a Sokol suit which has its own version. I'm not exactly sure what the, um, the different amounts of uh, protection are between the Sokol suits and the new SpaceX suits. But, um, you know, with the Sokol suits, the, the astronauts, they have to be able to withstand a very hard landing when they make it back down to Earth. And apparently the, the Starship one is a lot, sorry, the, the SpaceX Crew Dragon is a lot uh, smoother landing. You know, lands in the water, um, not as hard as the, the soy is. So it's like being dropped off a building apparently when you land, um, Pacer, will the first human on Mars be Chinese? Good question. Hmm. I'm going to say no. I think the first person on Mars will be an American but it'll probably be an international collaboration. So it'll probably be either the European space agency collaborating with Japan and, and the United States and probably not Russia at this point. I mean, the Russia is not being part of the Artemis Accords and neither is China. So, so I can't envision, a, an alliance, but it would be wonderful. It was like, wouldn't that just be the greatest that, that if every major spacefaring nation on earth co collaborated together to send a crewed mission to Mars, that would be the greatest. Um, but there are international treaties and, and embargoes and all kinds of things why that probably won't happen. But, uh, do not write out like, like, like Chinese won't be the first people on Mars unless NASA messes this up, but they will be quick. We will see, uh, we will see Chinese boots on the moon for sure. And we will eventually see Chinese boots on, on Mars as well. They're, they have a very serious and robust space exploration program and they're learning very quickly about how to, to do missions that are more complicated in terms of like the automated robotic missions, as well as the eventually the human missions. Um, Abhinan, Ab, Abhijan Saraswat Gogai, Gogai, I'm sorry, man, I'm totally, totally messing that up. 
Uh, let's say that we have the technology to build a Dyson sphere right now, then will we consider building it? If yes, then what will we do with the energy and how will we use it? Well, I always talk about, joke about this, that we have already begun building our Dyson sphere. Uh, when you look at spacecraft, like James Webb, when James Webb launches, it will be gathering energy from the sun and putting it to use. Um, it will be stopping some of the sunlight that would be making it out into deep space and then putting it to use here in the solar system. And so we already have, when you think about the number of spacecraft that are already out there blocking just an insignificant portion of the sunlight, we, uh, the Dyson sphere has begun. And that's what it's going to feel like as we build the Dyson sphere. We will figure out purposes for that sunlight over time, whether it will be um, uh, resource, uh, like manufacturing in space, whether it'll be, you know, distilling elements in space, whether we'll, we will figure out some kind of space power system and it'll just happen in little bits and pieces. And you'll come back a hundred years later and you'll be like, whoa, the Dyson sphere is much bigger now. There's a lot more solar panels that are gathering light from the sun. And then eventually every little photon that's streaming out of the sun will have made its way into some solar panel that's that'll be collecting it and so that's what it'll feel like when a dyson sphere uh gets built it won't just be like now we're going to build a dyson sphere let's get at it just in the same way that you look at the you look at a city right a city no no one just is like let's build an entire city just city just gets built bit by bit piece by piece year by year upgraded improved changed fixed destroyed demolished um until you have the city that you have today and a hundred years later it'll be a different city. So the Dyson sphere has already begun. Congratulations. You're living in the Dyson sphere age there. You're living in the future. Um, blue pill. How is it in 2020? We don't have a probe providing a 24 seven streaming the earth in full view at all times. Think it's impossible or it's being hidden from us. Uh, there's a bunch of spacecraft that are providing pretty much a full view of the entire earth 24 seven. Uh, there's the, my favorite one is the, the discover satellite. So if you just do a search for discover satellite, you'll be able to find it and you can get the raw image feed from the discover satellite. It's a whole view of the entire earth. It's, at the L1, the Earth Sun L1 Lagrange point. So it's it's pretty far away from the Earth, but it's got sort of the entire planet in view. And so it's able to watch the planet, watch how storms are moving, watch how aerosols are moving, um, watch large scale atmospheric issues. But it also is beautiful for being able to watch the planet. Um, the Russians have a similar telescope, a similar satellite electric. Tron people, people can put some, if someone could put a link to the discover satellite in the chat so that blue pill can, uh, can go and check out those pictures. They're all freely available to download. You can, uh, look at a storm that's on your part of the planet and then watch and see, or notice that that same picture is there in the, in the entire planet earth, um, version. So this idea that there isn't lots and lots of observations of planet earth from space is a lie. There are lots that you can freely access. So anyone who's telling you that is just trying to fill your head with nonsense. Um, and then there's all the weather satellites, which are flying lower and are providing, you know, more detailed regions and they're updated almost constantly. Um, so you can see any part of the earth you want and see how the weather patterns are moving around, how the, um, so the, there's plenty. Plenty, tons. So Discover and Electron are the two, Electro, Electro are the two, uh, yeah, the entire, Blue Pill, the entire planet in one picture. Um, no problem. If I can, it's the Discover satellite. And uh, Scott Manley's done a great job of, of animating stuff. So like take a bunch of frames of it and then show there you go, the imagery and data, explore the world in real time, launch the map, let me see. Yeah, so go to do a search for D-I-S-D-S-C-O-V-R, and then do a search for like discover and then like live data, and you'll see tons of it. So uh, yeah, this, the thing you want exists. Someone launched, in fact, it was Al Gore's idea to push for this um, 
satellite that had a, a view of the entire planet. And uh, it's been up there for five years now. And it's called the Deep Space Climate Observatory. Whole view of the entire Earth. All right, let's move on. Mr. Master, since black hole evaporation takes a lot of time, does that imply that every single black hole ever since the start of the universe is still alive? Yes. Uh, we won't see the black holes evaporate from the stellar mass black holes for like 10 to the power of 70, I think, years from now. So just a ludicrously long distance. The one possibility is that there could be primordial black holes that were formed right at the beginning of the universe. And if they exist, and there are various different sizes, then the smallest ones would have evaporated. The ones that are 10 to the power of 12 kilograms. So like anything smaller than a small asteroid would have evaporated by now if primordial black holes exist. But I did a whole video on this, just like one of the last latest videos that I did. Ricardo Favas, interstellar space is really hot or really cold? Uh, so the space itself, it's hard to sort of describe the idea of temperature in space, but the background temperature of the entire universe is 2.7 Kelvin. Uh, which is very, very cold, right? It's just, just a couple of degrees above absolute zero. But the um, but individual particles in space can be various temperatures. So Earth can be can be a nice warm temperature. The surface of the moon can be a hundred more than a hundred degrees Celsius or can be much colder at, at nighttime. And you can have individual particles in space that are millions of degrees and giving off x-ray radiation. Uh, so it just depends on, on where you are in space, what you're near, what is actually causing the, um, you know, what is causing the, the particles to be heated up. But yeah, you can have, temp you can have temperatures that are from all, just above absolute zero to millions of degrees out there in the universe. Um, Pacer. Is it possible to use the transiting technique to communicate between stars? That's an interesting question. Yeah, sure you could. Yeah. Uh, so the so I guess the question is, could you could you use the transiting? So you put some kind of object in front of the star um, that would then communicate to some vast distance. And sure, as long as you could change the shape of the thing and you knew which star you were attempting to communicate with, that that if you if you made an object that was say a triangle, it would provide a a different light curve as it passed in front of the star than if you had something that was a circle, if you had something that was a square, if you had something that was a more comp complicated shape like that, and so and so you could have something that you could somehow change the shape of it, or change like light on it as it passes in front of the star. Then maybe you could use that to communicate with some distant civilization. I mean, the idea that I like is the one that you could try to actually hide your planet by attempting to um, shine a light. So as your planet is passing in front of the star, you've got some other alien civilization that you know is watching you, and you shoot a laser right at them that balances out the amount that your planet is is causing in terms of its transit to even out and so the transit is undetectable. And so if you could do that, then it might it's probably just easiest to just shoot a laser, right? At whoever you're trying to communicate with. Um <laughs> Glenn Stoklasa, is it more likely that Planet Nine is a Neptune mass primordial black hole or planet? What do you think? I think it's like a million times more likely that it's just a planet than a primordial black hole a billion times more likely it's almost certainly not a primordial black hole we don't know they exist there's no evidence that they do um yeah a a, a plant a black hole would explain uh why we haven't been able to discover the planet but also just a planet that is too far away or is too dark or we just haven't found yet is the um more likely reason all right. Um, well, we've reached the end of our of our hour. Uh, so, if uh, so, thank you everybody for joining me this week. Like I said, we've got some another an interview coming up with uh, Christian Cotacini from HeroX. We've got more interviews. Fred Watson next week. He's a party, so I think you'll really enjoy that. 
and he'll provide all your answers about space and astronomy. I'll just kick back and let it happen um, and ask a few of my own. I'll make them harder. So, um, And thank you to uh, Nancy Graziano, who's been working so hard to try to make the virtual star parties happen. I, uh, I really hope that we're able to pull it together on Saturday. Um, like just weather, mechanics, telescope, people willing. So it'll be probably eight o'clock on, but maybe we can even go earlier now. I don't know, Nancy, you tell me. Um, so uh, thank you everybody for uh, joining me and uh, we will see all of you next week.